as we've got Tony, it would be criminal not to ask him uh, a few questions. We put out um, a tweet earlier on to the We Are West Ham listeners, of course. We invited them to, to get their questions in. So we'll have a few of those from you uh, at the end of this section here. But first of all, Tony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick us off. Uh, we have sort of briefly touched on it uh, because naturally it comes up at a few... Whenever you're talking about West Ham, um, this is the transfer activity. Now, uh, me and James are on the podcast. We've always uh, we pride ourselves and market the whole podcast on being balanced about West Ham. Um, it's not always easy because it's quite a, with such a passionate fan base, as you know. Um, we say the things, negative things that need to be said if and when we feel they need to be said. But we also try and, you know, focus on some of the lots of positive things that that do happen, particularly last year. Um, so my personal view on that before before we throw to you is that similar to when we left Upton Park, I feel really and will feel really frustrated. I'm quite happy to, to be patient and not go in two footed until the transfer window is closed because it's silly to do that. Then we all know what business can be done till late. However, when we left Upton Park, I don't feel the club capitalised on that feel-good factor. The league position, we had a really exciting manager at the time. The new stadium, it was like, what a time to be a West Ham fan this really is. We had a chance of you know, uh, that European campaign as well. We all know what happened there. Um, and that left you feeling so deflated because you just wondered what might have been all the time. This season, last season was brilliant. Probably one of, if not the best season in my life. It was just so enjoyable, just from a purely football side of things. Obviously, not being there wasn't great. And I'm really worried and at the moment and nervous about the transfer window closing and all of that big bubble that there was last season just bursting. Because I know we've got some fantastic players already. We have touched on it. But it is naive to think that particularly with the extra burden of European games, that it wouldn't be prudent, in my opinion, to sign more players. Uh, David Moyes has said already that, you know, he doesn't want to just sign people for the sake of it. But I think, again, this is a personal opinion. I think David Moyes is very good at, at, at you know, saying the things that are not only going to please fans, but that are going to, that his employers would like to hear as well. He's very good at sort of managing the media and keeping the heat down. But, not speaking too prematurely yet because the transfer window hasn't closed. What is your view on the, the West Ham transfer activity, particularly this summer, but obviously sort of in general in the, in the recent past because you had the, the Anderson Haller stuff as well. We have spent money on big players, haven't worked out, blah, blah, blah. But start with now and, and just give us your, your general thoughts transfer-wise. Yeah, well, I'll turn the floodlights on. I don't know if you noticed, boys. You couldn't see me in the last part of the uh, So it probably always helps, doesn't it? Um, Transfer-wise, um, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm I'm with you guys. Um, I'm frustrated as well. Um, I think we all are. Um, I agree it was, a, it was an incredible season. Um, you go into this season with that feel-good factor uh, that's been helped by a great win at Newcastle um, that's going to be there, as I've already said, on that first game. On Monday night, those of us that are lucky enough to be there, it's going to be a fantastic atmosphere. Uh, and we've got the European tour to come as well. You know, we've, we've hopefully had some great fixtures home and away that we can all enjoy and be a part of. Um, but having said all that, we don't have the squad that's capable of dealing with all the games at the moment. You know, um, I'm sure it's something that the manager would like to improve. Um, I know you said that Moisey says all the right things, but he... he he also says, and I agree with him, that you, you don't want to bring in the wrong type of player. You, you don't want to certainly don't want to spend the money on a player that maybe cost twenty million or something, and then he's not the right. You, you bought him because everyone's clamouring for a signing, and then when he arrives at the club, he doesn't fit in. So it's important to try and bring the right players to the club. I must admit, I'm a little bit disappointed with us not signing Adam Armstrong. I, I said it publicly. Mm. I've been saying it for ages. He's a goal scorer. He's a finisher. And he was someone that could have slotted into our squad. He got a fantastic goal at Everton at the weekend. Um, you know, so I was a bit disappointed with that. But having said that, you know, what was it, 15, 16 minutes? I don't know what the transfer fee was. I really, really don't know what the state of our books are. I say the state because probably the wrong word, but, the, you know, what condition our books are in, in terms of money we've got to spend. I don't know. We just had a, a big hit with Anderson. We've had a big hit with Haller. We've had COVID. 
There's been a lot of things going on. There's been no income coming into the football club. So I really don't know what the situation is with, you know, the manager's transfer budget, if, if, if you like. Um, I'm sure David Moyes, the, the one thing I can say, and with confidence, David Moyes is a fantastic manager. He's a fantastically experienced manager. He's been in Europe, not just with Everton, but with Manchester United as well. Mm. He knows what it takes to go into a European campaign and what you need to deal with the games. You know, this, this is the first time, well, it's, it's the first time in the club's history that we've been guaranteed six games. I know we've got to cut this cup, I understand all that, but, you know, that wasn't guaranteed. We had to win our way through those games. This is guaranteed football. Six extra games without even considering league <coughs> cup games, plus your 38 Premier League games, plus people like Deck and other players going away and playing in their suit checks and that going to play international football. It's a hell of a lot of games. So we need the squad to deal with that. And David Moyes knows that. He, he knows that. And he must be frustrated because I'm sure he would have wanted to have brought a few players into the squad by this stage, you know, particularly forwards, because as we've said, if Mickey gets injured, you know, God knows what we're going to do. You know, Again, I agree with what you said, Will. You can't jump to too many conclusions at the moment because there's still, what, a couple of weeks left at the window. But time is ticking every day. It's ticking away, ticking away. And We're doesn't... not even being linked with people, no, Tony. I'm That's t- what's a bit beat, worrying. You beat me to it. You, I'm just about to say, we haven't really been linked with too many players. So mm. does that mean that the manager's happy with the squad? Does it mean that he he's happy with the likes of, say, a Connor Coventry, if you like, you know, being part of the squad, being able to come in and do what, Someone else might do. I still wouldn't be surprised if Jess Lingard comes back, probably as a loan signing rather than a transfer at the moment. Um, but we do need players. We need bodies. And we need, if nothing else, we need bodies to take the pressure off the likes of Deck and Mickey that you know perhaps aren't going to be able to play all the games. So it, it's worrying. It, it is worrying. And, and that's a frustration because, as you quite rightly said, this is the most exciting start to the season that we've had for many, many a year. Um but it, it's, you know, I'll go back to the 86 season. We always end up talking about the 86 season. And then we didn't strengthen. I would, if I was you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we didn't strengthen for the start of the following season. And, of course, we then had a few injuries. And then it, it then became very difficult to deal with the games. So, you know, we don't want to see that happen. We're The club is in such a good position at the moment. It really is. Got great manager, great players. The fans are all excited. Europe, everything's going in the right direction. I think we just need at least two or maybe three outfield players. I know we signed a decent goalie, but we need some good players to just bolster the squad up a little bit and just put a smile on our face in the transfer window because everything else, unusually for a West Ham fan, everything else is fantastic, isn't it? It's just it's just the transfer window. James, um, just just quickly, mate. Sorry, before you, I know you've got a couple you want to read out there. So, Tony, could just from from a man who, who sort of you know in, inside football. Um, has been inside football as a player, you know, still in contact with lots of people inside the game now. Is it when fans, right, be it us or anyone listening to this, here's David Moyes say about bringing in right players and all that sort of thing. And then they look around. You mentioned Adam Armstrong, Patson Dacker um, has, has moved. Then, the, you know, they yeah, Danny Ings. Uh, uh, to be fair with that one, you know that that was a lot of money they paid for quite an injury-prone player. So I don't. If that one, you know, was too much for the club, one of those to... groups of that second-tier group that we were speaking about. Where when yeah. so you've got to say that really could we should we have been in the market for Danny Ings? Possibly. I'd have liked to have been, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And surely it'd have been an easier sell than than Villa. We're in Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. When when fans hear that and they go, oh, there's no, and David Moyes, sorry, goes, oh, we want to bring the right players in, and some fans will go, you you cannot tell me that there's not someone out there who would be suitable for West Ham that we are capable of going out and buying. When fans say that, is that reasonable or unreasonable? Because that's what I feel like at the moment. But I'm loath to say it because, like I said, we try and be balanced where we can. But is that well? Uh, yeah, that is just a bit of a hot-headed, hot-headed fan there, Will. Or is there actually legs in it? And would people like David Moyes or perhaps around the club be feeling that way? That come on, we must be able to do a bit better than because there's got to be grey area, surely, between spending forty million once or twice on Haller Anderson. There's yeah. got to be somewhere in between that and another goalkeeper we don't really need. Oh, of course there is, yeah. Um, you know, but you know, there was that clamour, wasn't there, two or three years ago? We had, we didn't, we never spent any money. We went out and spent hundred million or whatever, and you look back and you think, oh my god, what did we spend that money on? <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be a little bit careful. And 
the, 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 trans, the, the transfer of a football is, is very complex. It's always been very complex. And, it, you know, perhaps even more so nowadays with the agents and, you know, all the spin-offs and all the, you know, the add-ons and everything. And, it, you know, sometimes what maybe appears a, an easy deal is not an easy deal. I don't know. I mean, and you, you then come back to opinions. You know, like I, as I said, I, I love Adam Armstrong. I've followed his career. I think he's a fantastic goal scorer. I think he'll score goals in the Premier League and he's already gone and done that. Um, he got three less than Ivan Tony last year, didn't he? And everyone absolutely yeah, loves him. Exactly. So, you know, he, the, the goals are there. But, you know, it's about opinions. You know, did, did Davy Moyes uh, agree with what I, I, I feel or did he not agree? You know, he's the manager. He, listen, I'm, I'm coming on. I love talking to you boys and that. And hopefully the fans like listen to what I say. But I'm not the manager. It doesn't really matter what I think. It's about what the manager thinks. It's about his strategy. It's about his group of players. And, you know, you'd like to think that they, if they're looking for centre forward, you'd like to think they've got a one, two, three, four, five, six. And they, they're working their way through that list. And I don't know who number, I, I don't know. But if you can't get one, two and three, you're then after four and five. And you work, and that's often how it works, particularly in the transfer windows, which, you know, ever since the transfer windows come into play, it's made it very difficult for the clubs and the managers and the players and everyone to get everything done in the, in the, in the right time. Uh, you know, in the old days, you just went, oh, it's October and we're not scoring any goals. Oh, let's go and buy a player. And you went and done that. But you can't do that now. So you, you, all your business has got to really be done in the summer, which is where we are now, because we all know the January window is normally a, a nightmare window to deal in. It's overinflated money, wages, etc. So you want to be doing your business now. But come back to the point I made, you don't want to bring a bad egg into the group. If David Boyce believes he's got a real good tight-knit group of players who are all pushing and pulling for each other and working hard, you don't want to bring someone in who's getting, I don't know, extortionate wages, costs 25, 30 million pounds, meant to be the next best thing since God knows who. And they arrive at the club and basically he ain't bothered. All he wants is a few nights out in London. He ain't bothered. He don't want to try a leg and run around. And then you've done your money. So, you know, there is such a, a grey area there. And, you know, I'm trying to stick up for the manager. I'm trying to look at it from his point of view. Um, but I also get the fans' frustration. I'm frustrated, you know, because I'm looking at it. I think we need we need two centre-forwards. We probably need a centre-half maybe as a as a cover as well. We need some players into that squad. You've just got to hopefully trust that the manager, and you can't question the manager in the last, what, two windows, you know, previous to this one. He's been fantastic, hasn't he, with the players he's brought in. And, um, you know, he, he's just done a fantastic job. The club's been fantastic, let's say, not, not the manager, just the manager, but the club, in terms of the players they've brought in, it's been a lot better than what it was, say, three or four years ago. So, fingers crossed that we get some players in, because when we go on that European tour, we're going to need all the players that we can have at the club. It's based on that. Um, what? Let's just, let's just say, okay, well, they, only, they don't bring any players in between now and the end of the month. Um, or they bring Jesse Lingard in. He's the only player they brought in. Um, yeah. What What should our expectations be for this season, based on the fact that squad depth hasn't improved? Um, we've got six, at least six more games. Um, c- can we expect David Moyes and his players to to put on another solid season of top ten football, or should we be thinking a bit more realistically and going, if we're going to go for the Europa League, then we need to sort of half expect West Ham to finish 12th in the Premier League um, or vice versa? Um, I think it's going to be very hard to improve on last year. Let's be honest, you know, like improving on sixth position, that is going to be very, very difficult. You know, we've only ever done that twice in 120 odd years, whatever it is. You know, that is going to be really hard to finish above sixth position, especially with a European campaign. We know that. Um, What I'd like to see, I'd like to see us do exactly what we've done. We've made a great start. Get as many points on the board as you can in the early parts of the season, because like invariably, if you have a good start to the season, the confidence is there, the points are coming in, and then we can get to the stage hopefully where we can have we've got we've got to balance it out with getting a good run in the Europa League as well, and we need to qualify out of our group. Um, I think there's playoffs. I know I'm, I'm not quite familiar with how the playoffs will work, but I think the, I think I'm right in saying the top in the group qualifies automatically. I think second you go into a playoff. I think I'm right. With the Champions that. League dropout, yeah. Exactly. And that you could be playing anyone, couldn't you? But at least you then mm. would get that game in February. So we might have six group games and then the two playoff games in February. So you're looking at eight European games. But, you know, I, I think we've got a real, a, 
a realistic chance of doing really well in the Europa League. You know, I mean, I think Leicester will fancy their chances. I think we'll fancy our chances. And if any of the so-called top boys get knocked out and, you know, and end up parachuting into the Europa League, which often happens, you know, they'll fancy their chances as well, you know, especially as it's, you know, it's four of the top six playing in the Champions League. Um, you know, but our league is as powerful and as strong as any other league, if not better than any other league in Europe. So my point being is that I, I want to see us do well in the Europa League. I want to see us take it serious. We've had previous campaigns. I know it wasn't guaranteed group football, but previous campaigns where we've sort of, oh God, we've got a European game tonight and we never really put out a strong team. They weren't really bothered. It was all about staying in the Premier League. You know, I, I think that we, even if we finish 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, I will take that if we're, if we're doing well and progressing in Europe and we have a really good season in Europe. I will take that. You know, I think it's going to be really hard, especially with our lack of squad, if you like, at the moment. We haven't got we haven't got the 25 bodies that we probably need. We've probably got 20, 21. You know, at the, as things stand at the moment, I would take a mid-table finish and a really, really good run in the Europa League. And ultimately, listen, you know, if you get to the final and it's... It is feasible. I know it's a long old trek and everything, but you win the Europa League, you're in the Champions League, and you know we would that would be our ultimate dream and one of the best nights ever in the club's history, wouldn't it? So, yeah. um, you know that I think is it, there's different challenges that are going to happen during the course of the season, but you know it'll all unravel and we'll see how it goes. We'll see what the draw is like for the Europa League. We'll see how strong or how weak the group is, and then we'll all know where we stand with things. And I think the manager will manage accordingly. And like I say, his experience in Europe, we haven't got to worry about that. It's not like we're going into Europe with a manager who's a new manager who hasn't managed in Europe before. He knows what he's doing. And my advice to the fans, and I know it's frustrating at the moment, and I know we're all frustrated talking about it, have confidence in the manager and what hopefully he's trying to achieve over the next couple of weeks. And hopefully we will get those two or three players into the squad. Absolutely. Uh, Tony, we're coming towards the end of uh, of this section and obviously James has got a load of questions um, from fans later on. Just one more from, from us guys there. We opened it, of course, with just clarifying whether you had any involvement in the, the PIA, a PAI or PIA Capital, uh, as it's actually pronounced, um, and that takeover earlier on. I know neither of you heard the interview with Philip Beard, the former chief exec at QPR, who's fronting uh, the Pi Capital bid. He did speak on Talk Sport earlier today. So anyone listening, um, we've had obviously guys on from from Talk Sport before, um, and it is worth. He was on Jim White and Simon Jordan's show. So if if you haven't heard it already, do go back and listen. Uh, it's on Talk Sport Catch Up. Jim White and Simon Jordan, and go to midday. He literally came on on the stroke of twelve. So you have to um, you can go through on the the timestamps on their website. So do go back and listen. But I was listening earlier. I knew we had the podcast tonight, so I took down some notes. Um, one thing, he, I'll be honest, just straight away, immediate reaction. He didn't come across very well, Philip Beard. This is with Jim White and Simon Jordan. He was asked about whether a bid has gone in. He said a bid has gone in. West Ham maintained that an official one has not. So, again, I will get in what um, West Ham's stance is because, again, going at this nice and balanced. Um, but this from the Philip Beard earlier on. He said there has been a bid that's gone in. West Ham uh, refute that. He said that um, proof of funds did go in. Currently, West Ham say that the, the manner of proof of funds was not what you'd expect from a professional outfit, certainly not one attempting to take over a Premier League football club. Uh, Philip Beard said that he thought the bid was accepted by David Sullivan, and this is a quote, and he said, now the goalposts have changed. Uh, he described the Olympic Stadium as being underutilised and the Olympic Park. Uh, he he wants to uh, a series of profit generating activities in the park. He discussed about this is all on the talk sport interview this morning, by the way. Uh, he said he did confirm that his group are preparing a second bid. Uh, if, if, you know, the first one was even legitimate, he refused to confirm Simon Jordan, who's brilliant on these things, by the way, put a lot of pressure on. And asked all the right questions, the sort of questions you'd want to hear uh, as fans. Um, Philip Beard refused to confirm that they're in the region of, uh, because Crystal Palace recently had £90 million investment for 20% 
of the company, which obviously values their football club at around eight hundred million pounds. So Simon Jordan asked if if that's the region um, that the bid was for West Ham. Uh, Beard refused to confirm that. He mentioned sustainable models. He got a bit clammy when um, Simon Jordan just said, "You know, are you just going to run this as the same as as the current owners? Because ultimately, you are a, a private equity firm. You're looking for returns for your investors." He spoke about hospitality and premium seating. Uh, it seemed to me like he was dodging Simon Jordan's questions quite a lot. And he mentioned that West Ham's performances will be a key priority. Well, those of you listening to the interview or the podcast, just as I did, was if you're going to buy West Ham United Football Club, that should be your only priority, West Ham's performances. And then started talking about music and boxing events. Um, ultimately, he did mention about developing the training facilities, which was good and then it was talk about Haiti and Afghanistan ultimately it just didn't come across very well at all and it very much struck me and again I know you two haven't heard it but this is just for those at home who perhaps have and want a bit of reaction from it it struck me that it wasn't very West Ham focused Simon put it to him that is it just a property grab um Again, I know you haven't listened to it, Tony. So what what have you made of uh, of the whole talk around it and what you have heard and read so far? <clears throat> I, I, with all what you read out there, we have so much to digest, weren't there? I mean, um, I know one thing. I know what I'm going to be listening to once, <laughs> once I've finished this. Yeah, podcast. for sure. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll go and have a catch up and see exactly what was said. Um, um, one thing I would say is I can think of a two, two easier people to interview you than Jim White than, than Simon Jordan. They probably, he probably could have chose, uh, you know, two other um, interviewers who perhaps would have given him a bit more of an easier ride. Um, uh, listen, well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I find it very difficult to comment on things when I haven't heard the interview. You know, sometimes things can get taken out of context, and you've yeah, just of thrown a few snippets in there. Yeah, and it'd be, yeah, it would be course. really unfair for me to, to you know, judge. Philip Beard and his intentions. Um, I come back to what I said at the very start of this is the only thing that's important in all this is West Ham United Football Club, not the current owners, not prospective buyers, but West Ham United Football Club. And the the thing with the fans, with whoever takes over this football club, if they take over this football club, they will ask one question, all right? And you've read out some great things that Philip Beard said there and talk, spoke about, etc. Most of the fans will ask one question, how much have we got to spend in the transfer market? That will be the main question, and quite rightly so, that will be the question they'll ask. Because, you know, we've just spent 10 minutes talking about the transfer window activity and everything. And, you know, we all want to see players coming into this football club. Now, to, for players to come into the football club, if it's a case of we haven't got any money available, if that's the case, I don't know, then if someone's going to come into the club to take over, you then obviously want them to have money to spend on players. Otherwise, what is the point of having a takeover? Because you want, obviously, to take the club onto the next level. So, listen, I've got a bit of swatting up to do. I need to get up to date with all what's been said today and, you know, where these guys are coming from. And, uh, you know, then I can obviously give you a lot more of an informed opinion on where we are with things. But, um, you know, I just make the point again. I, I want what's best for the football club. And if, if what's best for the football club is this takeover, then great, let's get it on. If it's keep the current owners, then let's keep it going, whatever it might be. I want what's best for the football club and I would never say any, anything different. Yeah, absolutely. Jonesy, again, I know you haven't listened to it yet, mate. I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll put a link to, uh, for anyone listening at home who hasn't listened yet, I'll put a link to the tour, the TalkSport catch-up link in the description to the pod. So it's nice and easy for any of you listening. Obviously, you'll listen to the end of the podcast before you go and click onto that. Don't want you uh, disappearing before we've got here. Uh, what the rest of our fans and the listeners have got to say. Jonesy, you've got some questions from, from We Are West Ham listeners for Tony, just uh, as we come towards the end of what's been an absolutely brilliant podcast. Yeah, I just got a couple of, couple of quick ones. Uh, first one from James Hawkins on Twitter says, if you could bring one player from the 86 team in, in the position that you think we need right now, who would it be and why? Oh, wow. That's a cracker. It's a, it's a super. That we need in the team right now. Yeah. Um, it's always hard because you know we play two up front and we're not really playing two up front and it's always hard the, the easiest answer for me to give to that question James is that if you could parachute a world class player into the current team then 
I think you could do it. Now, in my mind, there was two players in their positions that you could consider as world-class. First one is the goalkeeper, Phil Parks. And I think there would probably be a clamour if you said Phil Parks or Fabianski. I think I'd have to go Parksy. Although with the current day, we you know with clearances and being good with your feet, etc. I don't know with Parksy because he was real. It was a fantastic shot stopper. So there, there is a little question mark there. But a quick answer to the question: world class player, Alan Devonshire. There must be a place in that current West Ham team for Alan Devonshire. And we had some wonderful players in our team. But for me, if I could bring back Alan Devonshire in his pomp, then he would play wherever in the team and you would, you'd move a few players around to get Dev out on that left-hand side and create and do what he did. He was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, next one from WHU underscore Mark Reaper. Uh, it's not Love the Mark Reaper. Not the Mark Reaper. Um, no, if what only. Player. What a player. <laughs> uh, he says, what were your favourite moments at Sky Sports? Favourite moments? Wow. Um... I honestly, never, I never expected a question like that. I'm thinking I'm on a West Ham podcast and I know I get the <laughs> sports ones. Um, We've had a couple of messages in while you're thinking about that, Tony. We've had a couple of emails, just not not with questions, just saying how much people enjoyed you on on no, Sky. Really and uh, sorry yeah. to sorry to not hear from you again. Yeah, and oh, that's really nice that people people are saying that. Um, uh, uh, listen, there were loads and loads of great moments, and I, I, I think there was one game up at uh, Wolverhampton. I remember it finished six four. I remember being in the <laughs> studio, and I think Reading beat Arsenal seven five in the League Cup. It was a crazy result, um, but it's. I think you more sort of remember the laughs really, and a lot of the laughs revolved around you doing things wrong as opposed as opposed to doing the things right. And uh, listen, there were too many bloopers that I was involved in, and. Uh, you know, some of them got shown at the, you know, the clips at Christmas or at the end of the season, and uh, a lot of them, <laughs> because you got people like Cammy making so many, so many yeah. mistakes. I, I, I think Cammy bailed us all out because it was all like <laughs> Cammy, Cammy heavy with um, the mistakes, and you know, you know, I mean, Cammy's when he missed the player being sent off is, is iconic, isn't it, for the show? You know, you know, oh, Giddy Jeff and all that stuff, which was brilliant. Um, you know, and I think he Merce going mad with Aguero's goal with the Man City when they won the Premier League, and it, it, just so many fantastic moments on the show. And um, I just, listen, I just loved, I love being a part of it in the twenty years covering the football. And like I say, as as good as the good games were, there's also those bloopers that you remember, and you know, just just fantastic times. But time for a new chapter, as I said earlier. Absolutely, James. Have, have you got any more there, Jonesy? I've, I've got, got one more. I've got one more from from mine. It's actually from me. Um, and given that you're such a good striker, Tony, uh, apart from goals that you've scored, uh, and you can't mention my goal at London Stadium a couple of months ago. <laughs> no, I can't um, remember yet. <laughs> yeah. What's, None of us can. What's, what's the best goal you've seen from West Ham in a game that you've been involved in? So that you've either played, well, uh, well that you've either played either for West Ham or against West Ham. Uh, best best goal, what, as in best team goal, you mean? I mean, best team uh, goal, best individual goal. Uh, well, I think oh, I, I can expand it and say that you've like you've been in the stadium for rather than been involved in. Yeah, um, I don't know. It's one of them. I've seen so many games and it all blurs a lot of it blurs into one, does it? And you know, I mean, a lot of my memories, really, to be honest with you guys, are, are more from my sort of early days as a kid and following the club and. You just seem that they seem to stay in your mind as a 14, 15, 16 year old, those memories, as opposed to what happened two seasons ago, where you're trying to remember what, what was that game two years ago, and you can't remember, and you, yet you can remember a game from 35 years yeah, ago. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think um, the the FA Cup semi final where Alan Dev scored a sensational goal, he played a little one two and scored against Everton. And then, of course, Frank Lampard Sr. dancing around the corner flag. I mean, <laughs> memories like that, you know, that will last for me forevermore. Um, I think the best team goal that I can remember West Ham scoring, in, in pretty much in, what we did involve myself, it was the goal at Chelsea. And yeah. if anyone's not seen the goal, it's 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 our second goal. We won 4-0 on the day at Chelsea. We played on a terrible pitch and Chelsea were attacking and we, we, we headed the ball out of our own box. And six passes later, the ball was in the back of the net with uh, as good a team move with third man runs and one twos and touches. And it was just a fantastic goal. So I'll go for the second goal against Chelsea that I did score. And it's not because I scored the goal, but it's because it was just the best team goal I was involved in. And then I can take me pick those, those 
so many goals that I could go on about, but we we probably ain't got time on a podcast to think nah. about. You know, this exactly. Really- yeah, we're only talking about. I was up at, uh, was at Chelsea on uh, Saturday for work, Tony, and I was funny enough talking about that exact game, the West Ham four nil one, only yesterday, and how different Stamford Bridge obviously looks now. But uh, oh. yeah, that's I'm sure a great memory for for loads of West Ham fans who were who were either there or or, or have seen it since. Um, I've just got uh, one more that's come in. Um, on the emails, Tony from Sasha that says, if you could uh, undertake one role at West Ham now in at this stage of your life, uh, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, I, I, don't, I think I think I'm afraid centre forward is off the table. Yeah, <laughs> unless we take the offside rule out. If we take the offside rule out, I might be at a goal angle. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, you know, listen. I, I, I don't think it would happen, but you know, I'd quite like to sort of not even work with the centre forwards, but maybe talk to the centre forwards and just, you know, pass on my experience. I had a, I had a little spell. I had a, I, when Colton Cole was playing, I had a, you know, I had a couple of chats with Colton, and you know, I like to think he appreciated you know, just talking to someone really because if you've been through that scenario, if you if you played in front of big crowds and you played away away games and you've been ten games without scoring a goal like I did, you know, and or you've scored six games on the trot. You know, all these different emotions that you you go through as a footballer, you know, because football ain't, it's not all ups. You know, there's so many downs. There's a lot more downs than there are ups. And, you know, I think there, maybe not just me, but just there must be room for ex-players to pass on their experience. You know, it doesn't have to be a centre forward. In my case, obviously, I'd love to talk to the forwards. No point in me talking about defending, is there? But, um, you know, there's plenty of other great players that have graced our club and many other football clubs as well that, you know, I think some, sadly, they, you know, the, once you're an ex player, you're an ex player and you're, you're almost not involved in things. And I think that's pretty sad because I think there's a lot of good ex players out there, a lot of good ex people out there that could really, really pass on some great experience. So that, that possibly is one role that I'd be, I'd be tempted with. Excellent. And I think we've already covered this uh, sort of early on, but uh, Richard just says, you know, what he's asked, what, what, what you're planning on doing, what are your future plans? And now you've left Sky. I don't know, Will. I honestly don't know. Um, you know, I've got a few things I'm discussing with people. Uh, you know, um, obviously my, my last 20 years has been broadcasting, so maybe there's some opportunities there. Um, as I said earlier, I'd like to be a little bit more involved at the football club with West Ham in whatever capacity that might be. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. You know, like you know, I've got a few talks ongoing, and I, I, I honestly don't. I can't answer the question because I don't. I just don't know. It's only we're only just over two weeks down the line, but you know, obviously over the the next few weeks and months, hopefully some great things will come up. And you know, I honestly believe, and so many people have said it to me that you know, one door closes, another door opens, and you know, I've, I've got to take that mentality forward and. You know, rather than sulking about the fact I'm not at Sky anymore, I've got to I've got to move on and be positive, which I will do. Absolutely. Well, let, uh, you know, the, we obviously send our very, very best to It's been wonderful to have you on tonight. And we have had a lot of messages come in, you know, lots of Thanks, positive guys. words. I really uh, appreciate about, that. Yeah, you know, you know about I'm, your a, time. I'm a West Ham boy. I'm a hammer first and foremost. So thank you very much, guys. And I'm one of you and I really appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, that wraps up our uh, Q&A section with Tony Cotty there. Tony, it's been brilliant having you on uh, the show.